This is Luqman Rafiq, and uh, I'll be taking you through this SBR paper for the June 2021 exam session. Um, so as usual, uh, whenever we start discussing about any of the exam paper, the first thing that we try to do is that we try to get through the syllabus and the examination guide of the paper, and then we move forward. So um, I'm going to start off and I'm going to start discussing about this SBR paper. Uh, so first of all, let me guide you people through this specific SBR thing that uh, the SBR paper is a very different paper as compared to the F7 or the FR paper. Why is it very different to the F7 or the FR paper? The reason being the method of examination is altogether different. At the FR level, you've got a lot of numbers, but at the SBR level, there are not many numbers that are uh, there. I mean, the numbers are there, but the discussion is there a lot. So you have to keep in, keep this thing in mind that if you are dealing with SBR, so that means what you would have to do is you would have to deal with multiple numbers. Uh, you'd have to deal with multiple discussions and et cetera. That is something that you have to do. Um, for the sake of having a quick recall, this is what the relational diagram of the SBR is. Uh, this paper has got relation with F financial accounting, which is also known as F3, has a relationship with FR, which is also known as F7, and then it itself comes in, which is the SBR. And you see, this is there, the relationship with the AAA, which is the P7. So. Although this is not the this is not uh, what we are here to discuss, but let me guide you people. For those of you who wish to who wish to attempt P7, uh, please make sure that you have studied SBR before attempting the P7 paper. The reason being that um, uh, you cannot attempt this P7 paper without the SBR. The reason being that a lot of content from SBR is examined at the P7 level, so it's always advisable that you attempt SBR before you approach the P7 paper. Now, how exactly is the paper going to be examined? So with respect to the SBR paper, uh, there are two sections just like in any other paper, but, uh, the, but the structure of these two sections is a bit different. We have got section A, which is of 50 marks. And we have got the question number one, and we have got the question number two. So from the past, from the past uh, experience, I'm telling you that one of the question is of 30 marks and the other question is of 20 marks. That's how it is. And this is specific question of 30 marks. This is about the group financial statements. This is majorly about the group financial statements, but it also includes the other areas of financial reporting also that are examined. So this question number one, it's going to be about the group financial statements but it is also going to include, it is also going to include uh, the other financial reporting issues also. The question number two is about multiple financial reporting uh, areas. So it covers up different areas of financial reporting. Um, the next is you've got section B where you've got two questions and each question is of 25 marks each. So that makes it a total of 50, 50 marks. So this is how the structure of the paper is, four questions. And uh, one of the question is of 30, one of them is of 20. And there are two questions which are of 25 marks each. And you do have an idea that one of the question is going to con contain, uh, one of the question is going to contain uh, consolidation. So that means you need to have a good grip over consolidation. But is it the consolidated financial statement that the examiner is going to require us to prepare just like he has been doing at the F7 level? So the answer is no, he's not going to be doing it. Uh, you don't have to prepare the consolidated financial statements, but rather it's more of a discussion or rather solving a small, a small, a small parts of the consolidated financial statements working. That is something that the examiner actually asks you. Now let's move a bit forward and discuss further. Um, if I move a bit forward and discuss further, uh, there is uh, another thing which is mentioned here, which is about the current issues. I'm just going to come on to the current issues that what exactly are these current issues all about. Um, if I go about um, the content of this labels, so you have got these uh, different sections, which are six sections, um, which constitute the SBR. 
And amongst these six sections, we are going to discuss each one of them one by one. They're what exactly are they? So the first one of them is the fundamental and ethical and the professional principles. And you could see that this is connected to all four of these sections. This is connected to all four of these sections. And you could see this is specific section also. This is also connected to all four of them. So technically this is connected to all of them. And this is also connected to all of them. So that means you would have the implications of this fundamental and ethical professional principles in all these four areas. And you will have the implication of all this changes and counting and regulation again in all these four areas. Okay, Avinash Bhartia, just wait a bit. I'm going to tell you that uh, how exactly are we going to be studying during this whole session. So don't worry about it and uh, stay connected to this uh, uh, class. And inshallah, you would, I would make sure that I go through one of the accounting standards also. Anyways, so now see, <clears throat> what is this fundamental and the ethical principle? That is something that we're going to talk about now. You see, when you study at the F8, which is the audit and assurance paper. So you do study the code of ethics, but uh, the code of ethics are examined in simple scenarios. They're not examined in a very technical scenarios at the F8 level. But at this SBR level, what the examiner he does is that he presents to you a ethical uh, dilemma. He presents to you an ethical issue. And uh, that ethical issue usually has an implication upon the financial reporting that the entity does that has an impact upon the uh, profits that has impacts upon the bonuses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what you need to do is that you need to discuss the solution. You need to discuss the matter in a specific uh, scenarios, what are you, whatever you are being given. And then you need to present the solution. Then you need to present the solution to those issues. So what you would, what you would actually come across is the ethical issue could be examined in one question, could be examined in multiple questions. And when the examiner is going to examine to you these ethical issues, what is he actually going to do? He can, he can, he can ask you to discuss uh, the matter and discuss whatever the ethical implications that are going to be there. And the second thing that he's going to do is that he's going to ask you to present the solution. I repeat, what is he going to do? He's going to ask you to present the solution. So this is how the ethical issues are going to be examined. And these ethical issues could actually be connected to any specific area of the slavers, uh, which is all these five different areas of the slavers that this ethical issue could actually be examined. The next is the impact of change in the accounting regulation. So this is also termed as the current issues. This is also termed as the current issue. Now, what exactly is this area of the slavers? So let me explain to you what this area of the slavers is. Now, um, when we talk about this current issue, so you need to understand that the concept of current issues is that uh, the accounting standards are developed by IASB, which is the International Accounting Standards Board. Uh, the accounting standards are developed by IASB, which is the International Accounting Standards Board. And from time to time, IASB considers that uh, whether these accounting standards are in line with the framework that they have developed or not. So maybe possible, uh, they could come across, let's say, let's say they could come across IAS 12 income taxes and they could identify one, two, three, maybe three issues with respect to the, how the accounting is performed under IES 12. So what would happen is if they could come across any of this situation under this IES 12, then what is going to happen is they would actually set up a meeting of the board. They would discuss the issue and they would have a debate over the issue 
and they would try to uh, figure out a solution to this specific uh, apparently wrong accounting treatment that is available in the relevant accounting standard. They would uh, publish an exposure draft. They will accept the opinions from the public. And then they would finally issue the revised standard. So like the International Accounting Standard Board, they do have the responsibility to prepare the financial statements. Uh, they do have the responsibility to prepare the financial reporting standards. But at the same time, what they do is that they do review, they regularly review the inconsistencies or the problems that exist in the financial reporting standards. And in case if they figure out any of the inconsistencies in any of the IFRS, so what do they do? They actually uh, review, they actually discuss the issues that are there in the accounting treatments. They, can, they, 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 they undergo a debate on that. They figure out a solution to that. They establish an exposure draft. They offer the public, they accept the public comments and then they issue the revised accounting standard in case if that is needed. So what the examiner does is that from the perspective of the SBR paper, the examiner, he specifically mentions that what are the current issues that he is going to examine. I repeat, the examiner specifically mentions what are the current issues that he is going to examine. So whatever the current issues that the examiner is going to examine. Um, so they are already listed in our, they're already listed in our slabus. And when we go on attempting the paper, when we go on attempting the paper, so examiner usually tests you two types of question. And what are those two different types of questions that are usually tested is that, what was the need for a change in accounting? So that is usually one of the very common question that the students are being asked that what was the need for a change in the accounting? And another specific question that is being asked was that um, how the change in accounting will have an impact on the entity's financial statement, on the entity's financial statements. So that is another thing that the, that the, that the examiner usually examines. So basically the number one thing is that what was the need for the change in accounting? The first thing is what was the need for the change in accounting? So generally speaking at times what happens is uh, whatever the changes that are examinable, I repeat, if you go onto the IASB website, you might come across 20 changes that are proposed to be made, but those 20 changes are not going to be examinable. The examiner is going to mention in your slabus that what are the changes that are examinable in your exam attempt? And he's only going to examine those changes. He's not going to examine everything. So that's the first thing that you need to understand that it's not going to be every single thing that the examiner is going to, that the examiner is going to test. Now, what next is there? Uh, the next different type of question that the examiner may actually ask is that how the change in accounting will have an impact on the entity's financial statement. So at times in the past, what the examiner has done is he has given a scenario and he has asked that what is going to be the current accounting and what is going to be the proposed accounting of the matter. So examiner has in the past asked such questions that what is going to be the current accounting and what is going to be the proposed accounting so these are the things that the examiner has actually asked in the past. So the second important area is the current issue. I repeat, the second important area is the current issues. Now let's move a bit forward. So again, the current issue is connected to all areas because the current issue could arise from with respect to everything, with respect to financial reporting framework, with respect to this uh, whole group entities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Let's move a bit forward. <clears throat> and with respect to this section B, C, and D, I'm going to go through this specific aspect. Okay, there is a question. Okay, uh, can somebody please confirm to me if the, if the voice is clear? Uh, because there is a student who is saying that the voice keeps on breaking. So can you just let me know if the voice is clear? Okay, the voice is clear. I'm sorry, I'm unable to pronounce your name. 
uh, Nexongo, uh, please, uh, you need to check at your end because everyone is clear on voice over here. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Edimola. Now, so let's talk about this section B of the syllabus. So with respect to section B of the syllabus, what is examined is, with respect to section B, there is this financial reporting framework that is examined. So you do know that there is a uh, framework, which is the conceptual framework that is being published by the IASB. I repeat, there is a conceptual framework that is published by the IASB. So what is actually happening is that this is specific conceptual framework is also examinable. So uh, the examiner is specifically asked questions that might be very, not a very big question, but some short questions that the examiner does ask with respect to the conceptual framework. There have been situations in the past where the examiner has asked for the accounting of a matter using the conceptual framework for a specific matter. So that is also something that the examiner has asked in the past. <clears throat> okay, now. Let's move a bit forward. Now with respect to part C, you could see the name of all accounting standards. There are some of the standards that you do know from your past studies. And there are a few standards which are totally new for you people. So you do know about the revenue recognition from your past studies, IFRS 15. But IFRS 15, whatever that you have studied at the F7 level, that is a very small portion of IFRS 15 that is examinable. Here, what you are gonna do is you're gonna be seeing the whole IFRS 15. I repeat, here you're gonna see the whole IFRS 15. Okay, now let's move a bit forward. Okay, now let's move a bit forward and discuss further. So you see there are different accounting standards that are examinable. So uh, since you do understand that this is the final reporting paper, so almost every single accounting standard is examinable. I would specifically like to highlight this non-current assets and this provisions contingent uh, liabilities and uh, events after reporting period. Uh, why am I specifically highlighting them? Because they are examinable at the FR level also, but yet they are examinable at this SBR level also. And believe me that they are examined approximately of 20 to 25 marks that these specific areas are examined. Why? Because what happens is there are small, 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 small portions that the examiner examines with respect to these accounting standards. Now, the next thing is the financial statements of the group entities. So that's the consolidated financial statements. So from the, from, from, from the F7 perspective, you have already discussed two subs, you've already discussed a subsidiary. You have discussed an associate. That is something that you have discussed. You have discussed the unrealized profit transactions. You have discussed the intra group balances transaction, etc. You have discussed all of them, but here we are going to be talking about the consolidated cash flow. We are going to be talking about more than one subsidiary, two or more subsidiaries. We are talking. We are going to be talking about joint ventures. We are going to be talking about the foreign subsidiaries, etc., etc. All of them is actually going to be examined at this level. So I repeat, all of them is going to be examined at this level also. So you would have to make sure that you do know these areas very, very well. I repeat, you do need to make sure that you know these areas very, very well uh, in order to be able to succeed 
in this specific exam. So uh, we are going to go through the entire consolidation. I repeat, we are going to go through entire consolidation, uh, which would include everything, uh, like uh, the basics uh, at the F7 level, uh, the cash flows, the joint ventures, more than one subsidiaries, foreign subsidiary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Every single thing is going to be, every single thing is going to be discussed, inshallah. Now. Now, there's this section E, which is interpret financial statement for different stakeholders. Now, when we talk about the stakeholders, so you do know that the financial statements are not just, are not just examined by the shareholders, but your customers, your suppliers, the lenders, uh, the general public, a lot of people, they actually review your financial statement to have an idea about you as an entity. So I repeat, a lot of people actually inspect your financial statement. Uh, so uh, this is something that you have to understand that the shareholders, customers, suppliers. So every single person uh, usually has a look of the look at the entity from a different perspective. Like few people want to look at the financial performance of the entity. Few people would like to look at the non-financial performance of the entity. So this specific area, which is the interpretation of the financial statement for different stakeholders is going to actually cover up what? Is going to cover up measuring of the performance using the financial and using the non-financial aspect. All of them is actually going to be covered up in this specific area. Okay, and lastly, I've already discussed. So if we talk about the slabus, this is what the slabus is, that from the exam perspective, you need to make sure that there is a lot that you need to cover up for the SBR slabus. And inshallah, what we would be doing is, we would be going through the SBR course in detail. And uh, I'm just going to tell you people the approach also that I'm going to adopt with respect to teaching this SBR paper. Um, <coughs> so basically what happens is, um, let me show you. Um, we have got this website of ours, which is called a Scriber Academy. Once you go on to this Scriber Academy, um, uh, you would actually be registered. So you would have access to your login ID and password. So you would log in to the various, uh, you would log in. And once you would log in, what would happen is you would have your own dashboard, which is going to show you uh, the course that you have actually enrolled into. Um, let me just see. Okay, so that is actually going to show you the course you have enrolled into. And once you would actually have an idea about the course that you're enrolled into, you could see that this is what is appearing. Uh, that this is uh, 30 chapters and 344 lectures. A lot of students, when they look at this 344 lectures, they get very confused that do we have to go through these 344 lectures? So what does this mean? Does this mean 344 hours? So let me, let me be very clear and let me explain to you people that this 344 lectures does not mean 344 hours. I repeat, this 344 lectures does not mean 344 hours. What I'm going to show you people is the IFRS 16 leases, which uh, is pre-recorded available over here. So if you could just look at this IFRS 16 uh, from lecture number one till lecture number 17, there are 17 lectures in it. This does not mean that this is a 17 hour lecture. You just see the first lecture is of 50 minutes. Okay. The second one of them is of four minutes. Third one of them is of 48 minutes. Third, fourth one, 33 minutes, 21 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes, 17 minutes, eight minutes, 19 minutes. Now, what is it actually happening? So what I've actually tried to do is that I've tried to, I've tried to break down my lectures into the various type of concepts that I've delivered. Like for example, 
if i have gone through the introduction and the accounting by lessi so i have actually covered up using one specific lecture i have solved one basic question of lessi's accounting uh, i have i have I've recorded it in another question and then if i have talked about the lessi's accounting rental and arrears rentals and advance so i have split it all of them so just to make sure that the lectures become easier for you people to go through i have split it them like for example you could see is 33 a 10 minute lecture on the introduction to eps <laughs> well this is 36 seconds only 23 minutes 6 minutes 9 minutes 10 minutes 13 minutes but what you could see is that the headings of these lectures it says introduction to eps the reason and the background for issuing is 33 the basic eps computation how do you compute the profit attributable to ordinary shareholders the weighted average number of shares the bonus issue and the weighted average number of shares right issue and weighted average number of shares diluted eps concept etc etc so what i've tried to do is that i've tried to split down this course into into multiple parts so that it becomes easier for you to go through like this whole is 33 would be hardly two and a half hours of lecture so what happens is once you enroll with us for this course so you get access to i repeat you get access to this pre recorded lectures and once you get access to these pre recorded lectures so how do you have to study you have to study in the sequence so um, how do we actually teach uh, we teach like this as i told you you get access to uh, this pre recorded lectures um and then what happens is <clears throat> i try to conduct a uh, one live class per week and in those specific live classes what i actually do is that i usually go about with two approaches at times may be possible that i would go through a separately new accounting standard and its questions i would teach the whole accounting standard and would solve its questions that's one of the approach that i go through in the live classes or at times what happens is i tell you people that you review x y z accounting standard and once you have reviewed the xyz accounting standard then what i do is that i i i i revise that accounting standard in the class and i practice the questions of that accounting standard in the class this is something that i do so the approach that we usually adopt like just like now we are standing uh, in the mid of march so let's say from the mid of march till the end of april till the end of april we would not be having many classes it's going to be approximately eight classes that we would be having from this time period and then what happens is once the month of may starts so i would be taking class every third day probably uh, or maybe even what i could do this time round because i am just planning to be uh, going an extra mile this time round and which could be like um, every second day so i could just expect around 15 to 20 sessions in the month of may and in those 15 to 20 sessions what i'll be doing is i will actually be going through i repeat what i'll be doing is uh i'll be going through um the i'll be going through the past paper questions uh let me let me just show you what i did in the i'm sorry i could not i did not share the screen with you people the correct screen i'm really sorry about it i thought that the, you could see the screen but you could not see the screen sorry about it so i was just mentioning that you will get access to pre recorded lectures there is going to be one live class per week and usually what i do is that i go about new accounting standard and a questions usually in the initial classes and then in the subsequent classes i go through i tell you people in advance that you have to review x y z accounting standard and then what i do is that i revise that accounting standard quickly while uh, conducting the class and i go through the questions pertaining to that accounting standard in the class ah uh, yes avinash just fade a bit now so i'm just telling you that from the mid of march till the end of april it's going to be approximately eight classes that i'm going to conduct and uh, in the may what i do is that i i would try to conduct 15 to 20 live sessions till the exam date 
and those live sessions usually consist of the past paper questions. Uh, let me show you uh, some of the live session that I conducted this time round. I mean, this is the previous session that I conducted. So I went through majority of the accounting standards that are examined at the F7 uh, level. And then uh, I attempted the exam questions. So uh, there are approximately 35 lectures that are available in the live sessions that I conducted. In fact, I had more classes. There were more lectures. Probably not every single lecture is available over here. But anyways, this is what we did. So um, what I can tell you is that you don't have to worry about how the preparations are going to come along. You have to practice. You would have to, you would have to put in your side of the effort and I'll make sure that I put in my side of the effort. It's only going to be the combined effort that is going to take you through to the exam. Now see one more thing that I wanted to tell you people. And what is that one more thing that I wanted to tell you people is that this time round, we will be going through with the mock sessions also. And uh, these mock sessions plus uh, the mock reviews also. Because a lot of his students, they come across this problem that, okay, first of all, we want to attempt mock. Then we need to know that how was our mock? How was our performance during the mock? So inshallah, inshallah, we will have the mocks. And along with the mocks, I will, I will also... I will also be going through the mock reviews so that you people do know that what happened, what went wrong, where did you made up an error? This is something that I'm going to do and I'm going to be focusing upon this. Now, let me guide you a bit further, um, which is uh, a student is asking me that would you be going through the F7 area? Yes, I'll be going through F7 areas. Don't worry, they're already... Uh, uploaded also, but I'll be going through them also. Uh, there is a student who's asking that how to attempt the CBE. So don't worry about it. Just wait. Let me demonstrate to you. Uh, if you could just see, this is the ACCA website and this is the SBR section. This is SBR CBE introduction. This is CBE preparation and this is CBE question practice platform. For example, I'm just saying CBE preparation. I've clicked on CBE preparation. I'll click on to this CBE question practice. There's the CBE ACCA practice platform. Uh, okay, let me tell you that there are still few countries where the exam is going to be paper based, but there are many countries where the exam is going to be CBE based. So what we would be doing is we would be, we would be, we would be uh, practicing some papers on the examination platform also. <clears throat> so let's say, for example, if I click on uh, this uh, practice exam, <clears throat> let me demonstrate to you. Okay, unfortunately, I cannot do it right now. Uh, wait. Okay, I cannot do it right now. Uh, it's just that uh, I'll cover it up in the next session. Don't worry about it. I'll be, I'll be using the CB practice platform because our development team is working on this platform also. So what you would be getting is that we will have the CBE available in this platform also. So the relevant ACCA CBE is also going to be available in this platform. So don't worry about it. We'll kind of cover it up over here also. So anyone has any questions pertaining to whatever that we have discussed up till now? Uh, just let me know so that uh, I can move a bit further. Yeah, just let me know in case if anyone has got any questions. Jihane, I mean, passing rate of uh, SBR is um, is more than 50 percent <clears throat> okay tahir uh, you have to follow the sequence the sequence of the lectures that are available
Okay, now um, let's move a bit forward and let's have a discussion about few of the areas. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with IFRS eight operating segments. Let's start discussing what is the background to IFRS eight operating segments. Um, in order to understand IFRS eight, there is something that you need to know that there are a lot of entities, I repeat, there are a lot of entities uh, which operate in multiple sectors. Like there is, there may be a group of companies which is having an investment in the textile sector, which is, an invest, which is having an investment on the automobile sector, having investment in the power sector, having investment in the transport sector, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let me tell you that at times what happens is there are a lot of entities. What they do is that they invest in multiple sectors. Like for example, there could be a company which is having an investment in the textile sector, automobile sector, power sector, transport sector. So that means if an entity has invested in these multiple sectors, so ultimately the performance of these sectors will have an impact on the entity's performance the entity's performance, the entity's financial statements, entity's profit and loss account, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, would be impacted by the performance of this textile, automobile, power, transport, every single sector. Now, assume that you have invested. Uh, yes, uh, Salman Khwaja, that's, that's true. It's, uh, it's more of a theory that is examinable. Now, for example, you have invested in this specific parent company or in this specific company which has invested into multiple sectors. And now you do have an idea that the automobile sector and you do have an idea that the transport sector um, they are going to be performing very badly in the upcoming months. If this automobile and the transport sector is expected to be performing very badly in the upcoming months, that means their sales are going to go down and ultimately their profitabilities are also going to go down. And hence, if this entity has invested in automobile, if this invested has invested in transport, so ultimately it would have an impact upon this entity's financials also. So resultingly, what I could expect is that this company's profit to go down and hence this company's share price to go down. So I, as an investor, I repeat, I, as an investor would like to take an exit from this company's investment in case if I think that the future is going to be a downfall in share price. Now, the problem that arises is if this specific parent company is not disclosing in its financial statements that how much proportion of its revenue are from the textile sector, how much proportion of its revenue are from the auto sector, how much proportion of its revenues are from the power sector, how much proportion of its revenues are from the transport sector. If this specific entity is not disclosing this in its financial statement, how as I user of the financial statement know that what is my exposure with respect to investment in this company? I would never know about it. So in order to, in order to overcome this specific issue, in order to overcome this specific problem, the accounting standard named as IAS 14 segment reporting was introduced, which was later on replaced with IFRS 8 and the name of this IFRS 8 was operating segment. And what exactly is the objective of this operating segment accounting standard is that in case if you are a company which is operating in multiple industries, if you are a company which is operating in multiple industries, if you are a company which is operating in multiple geographical locations, if you are an entity which has got the multiple types of products if you have got multiple divisions, then you as an entity have to make sure that you provide your user of the financial statement 
detailed disclosures about the various sectors various geographical locations various industries various products where you have invested the money in so basically ifrs 8 operating segment is with the major objective is to make sure that the user of the financial statement gets to know the maximum about how the entity earns from where the entity earns that is what the objective of ifrs 8 operating segment is now let's move a bit forward and let's try to discuss further the next thing with respect to ifrs 8 that you need to know is that <clears throat> i repeat the next thing with respect to ifrs 8 is you need to know that ifrs 8 is only a disclosure based accounting standard now what exactly do you mean by only a disclosure based accounting standard that is whatever ifrs 8 is it's only applicable to the notes to the financial statements of the entity last segment <laughs> okay i said that it's divisions multiple divisions that is what i said multiple divisions now i repeat what happens is when we talk about the ifrs 8 ifrs 8 is only a disclosure based accounting standard and what exactly do you mean by the ifrs 8 to be disclosure based accounting standard this actually means that ifrs 8 only applies to the notes to the financial statements of the entity i repeat this would mean that the ifrs 8 only applies to the notes to the financial statement of the entity so you don't have to apply ifrs 8 to the profit and loss account you don't have to apply ifrs 8 to the balance sheet you don't have to apply ifrs 8 to the cash flow it's just the notes to the financial statement that you apply ifrs 8 to okay now let's move a bit forward and let's discuss further that uh, what exactly do you mean by an operating segment in accordance with the definition laid down in ifrs 8 operating segments so what does it say it says operating segment an operating segment is a component of an entity now the first thing is what is a component of an entity so the component of an entity could be a part of an entity the component of an entity could be the geographical area of operation the component of an entity could be a line of business so it says an operating segment is a component of an entity that that meets all these three conditions what are these three conditions that is it engages in business activities from which it may earn revenues and incur expenses including revenues and expenses relating to transactions with other components of the same entity so in short what happens is that it is engaged in the business activities and what exactly do you mean by engaged in the business activities that is it generates the revenue that is it incurs the expenses so this is something that this specific component which could be a division which could be geographical area of operation which could be a line of business which could be a branch office etc etc that specific component has to do all this thing whose operating results whose operating results operating results would actually mean what the profit and loss account uh, the sales the expenses etc etc whose operating results uh no uh negongo you are not allowed to take accounting as standard to the exam hall so it says whose operating results are regularly regularly reviewed by the entity's chief operating decision maker uh we give this a short form of codm the chief operating decision maker is given the short form of codm to make decisions about resources to be allocated to the segment and assess its performance and for which discrete discrete means separate discrete means separately identifiable financial information is available 
Now let's try to have an understanding about this definition of operating segment in detail. For example, there is an entity and what happens with respect to this entity is that it has got multiple uh, branches, branch one, branch two, branch three. What happens is um, all of these branches meet the definition of the component. Now, the second thing is that do they incur, do they engage in? Now, the next thing is that, so I told you that number one, these branches are the components of the entity. Now the question mark is, do they engage in the business activities? So yes, all of them make sales. All of them incur expenses. All of them make sales. All of them incur expenses. All of them make sales. All of them incur expenses. Now, the third thing is, whose operating results are regularly reviewed by the chief operating decision maker. Now, let me guide you what exactly is a chief operating decision maker. You see, the chief operating decision maker is the name of a role. It's not a designation. It's not a designation. It's the name of a role. I repeat, it's not a designation. It's the name of a role. So who is a chief operating decision maker? When we talk about this chief operating decision maker, it could be your chief executive officer. It could be a chief operating officer. It could be your chief financial officer. Um, it could be your board of directors. It could be the, um, I mean, like it could be anything. So anyone, anyone who has got the responsibilities, who have got the power to decide the allocation of resources, decide allocation of resources. So that specific person is going to be considered as the chief operating decision maker of the entity. I repeat, anyone who has got the power to decide the allocation of resources So allocation of resources. So anyone who could decide about allocation of resources, that person is going to be considered as what? That person is going to be considered as chief operating decision maker. Now, let me guide you something. For example, uh, this segment makes a sale of 10 million a year. This segment makes a sale of 500 million in a year. This segment makes a sale of 800 million in a year. Now I being the chief operating decision maker of the entity only review the result of these two of these two branches every month. With respect to this branch, I only view the results once in a year. So now what happens is just because of the fact that I don't review the results of this branch on a regular basis, this is not going to be an operating segment. Why? Because one of the conditions for a segment, for an, a component to be an operating segment is that its results should be regularly reviewed by the chief operating decision maker. What do I mean by regularly review? So the frequency by which you review the results of your other segments, you review the results of this segment also. If you don't review, that means you don't consider it to be an important segment. And if you don't consider it to be an important segment, that means we don't consider it to be one of those areas for which the separate information is to be provided to the user. Because ultimately, remember, we are talking about the IFRS 8 to be a disclosure-based accounting standard. I repeat, we are talking about IFRS 8 to be a disclosure-based accounting standard. So if it's a disclosure-based accounting standard, you need to give disclosure of the things which are important, not of the things which are useless. So the chief operating decision maker is only reviewing the results of these two segments regularly. That means this is not an important segment. If this is not an important segment, this is not an operating segment. Do you people get it? Yeah, do you people get it? Okay, good enough. Now let's move a bit forward.
uh, yeah, section one is not going to be considered as an operating segment. How would we disclose it? I'm going to let you know, but we are going to disclose this section two and section three separately. Now try to understand more. So what happens is for anything to be an operating segment, it has to engage in the business activities, number one, which includes the revenue generating activities, which is that you make a sale, you incur expenses. The second thing is its results are regularly reviewed by chief operating decision maker. The third one of them is for which discrete financial information is available. That means for which separate financial information is available. That is all going to be something that is going to arise. Now, let's try to understand this. <clears throat> So do you people understand the concept of the operating segment? What is an operating segment? A component of an entity. The component could be a part, could be division, could be geographical area of operation, could be a line of business, could be branch, anything that engages in the business activities from which it may earn revenues and incur expenses, whose operating results are regularly reviewed by the chief operating decision maker, I told you, who a chief operating decision maker is, and then for which discrete financial information is available. So all of these conditions are required to be met for an operating, for a, for, for a component to be considered as an operating segment. Now let's move a bit forward and let's discuss further. So one of the steps with respect to, I repeat one of the aspects with respect to this IFRS 8 operating segment is that you need to identify uh, operating segments. Now, so with respect to IFRS 8, the step number one is that you have to identify what operating segments are there. That's number one. The next thing that you need to do with respect to IFRS 8 is, is step number two. And what is this step number two? Step number two is you need to identify you need to identify reportable segments. You need to identify reportable segments. So I repeat, the first step was that you had to identify the operating segments. And the second one of them is you have to identify reportable segment. Now, what exactly do you mean by reportable segments? So when we talk about the concept of this reportable segments, so as per the requirements of IFRS 8, IFRS 8 says that a reportable segment is an operating segment, is an operating segment whose results are separately recorded, whose results are separately presented in the financial statements. So your operating result, your operating segments whose results are separately presented in the financial statements that is going to be considered as your reportable segment. I repeat, what is the reportable segment? Reportable segment is your operating segment whose results are separately presented in the financial statement. So like, for example, you may have got um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's say you've got seven operating segments. You've got seven operating segments. And when you've got seven operating segments, there is a specifically a criteria laid down which identifies that what is a reportable segment amongst these seven operating segments. So maybe, maybe you've identified that this segment number one is not reportable, segment two is, segment three is, segment four is not, Segment five is not, six is not, seven is. So maybe what happens is there could be many operating segment, but it's not necessary that you are gonna report separately the results of every operating segment. So maybe you report the results of these three segments separately. So they are gonna be considered as what? 
they're going to be considered as your reportable segments. Now, <clears throat> a question mark that arises is, how exactly do we identify a reportable segment? So for that, I'm going to tell you people, just wait a bit, I'm going to explain to you. First, try to understand the concept of reportable segment. That a reportable segment is one of those operating segment whose results are separately presented in the financial statement. Yeah, so is everyone okay with this concept of reportable segment? That it's one of the operating segment, it's, it's an operating segment. Now, first and the foremost important thing is, a reportable segment is an operating segment. That means it has to be an operating segment first. So it's an operating segment whose results are separately presented in the financial statement that is going to be considered as reportable segment. Okay, now see, so how do we actually identify an operating segment to be reportable segment? No, uh, Denomi, uh, the voice isn't going. I'm just waiting for you people to get back to me if you people are okay or not. Uh, the voice doesn't go. I just take a break to help you people absorb whatever that I'm saying. Okay, so see, uh, now what makes an operating segment to be reportable? So there are various quantitative thresholds. There are various quantitative thresholds. What do you mean by these quantitative thresholds? It says an operating segment becomes reportable if any of the following conditions are met. So what does it say? It says an operating segment becomes a reportable segment if any if any of the following conditions are met. What are those conditions? The first one of them is its sales. Its sales are greater than or equal to 10% of um, the sales of all operating segments. internal and external. Number two is that its assets are greater than or equal to 10% of the total assets of all operating segments. And then the third requirement is that um, its profit 
or loss in absolute terms is greater than or equal to 10% of the higher in absolute terms profit of all operating segments having profit and loss of all operating segments <coughs> having a loss so i repeat what happens is when we talk about the concept of these quantitative thresholds what exactly are these quantitative thresholds so the quantitative thresholds are the numbers that are being laid down in ifrs 8 and uh, if an operating segment meets any of these following conditions if an operating segment meets any of these following conditions one of the conditions is about the sales one of the condition is about the assets and one of the condition is about its profit or loss so if an operating segment meets any of these conditions then that operating segment becomes a reportable um um it says if uh, the sales or the assets or the profit or loss all of these things so what actually needs to be done is that if any of these criteria is met then what happens is you need to um uh, you need to make that operating segment a reportable segment now how exactly do we how exactly do we do it so for this uh, i'm just going to explain to you one by one uh, so in case if you wish to copy just let me know uh once you are done and then i'm going to move forward so um if any of these quantitative thresholds are met then what happens is i repeat if any of these quantitative thresholds are met then an operating segment becomes a reportable segment how let's try to see this thing so one of them is its sales are greater than or equal to 10% of the total sales of all operating segments now try to understand this you have got operating segment a b c d you have got 1000 you have got 100 million sale 200 million sale this segment has got 20 million sales and then what happens is <clears throat> uh this segment has got um 33 million sales now what are these sales are these external sales or internal sales so uh, they include both of them now see <clears throat> what happens is 100 million plus 200 million plus 20 plus 33 gives you 353 million this is the total sales of all operating segments now if i try to identify which of them meets the criteria for sales what am i going to do i am going to say 100 divided by 353 i am going to say 200 divided by 353 i am going to say 20 divided by 353 33 divided by 353 so if you look at this so 100 divided by 353 is 28.3% 200 divided by 353 gives you 56.7% 20 divided by 353 gives you 5.67%. 33 divided by 353 gives you 9.3%. Now, if you look at all of this, you would identify that on the basis of sales, this operating segment is reportable. This is reportable, but this isn't and this isn't reportable. So the first criteria was the sales criteria. so we have identified that it was the operating segment a and it was operating segment b that met the criteria the operating segment c operating segment d they did not meet the criteria so the operating segment c operating segment d did not meet the criteria for the sales now what next is there the next situation is um, let's let's move a bit forward and let's discuss further
the next situation is um it says <clears throat> it's pro its assets are greater than or equal to 10% of total assets of all operating segments so the same thing that you have to do you have to calculate total assets and you have to compare the assets of the operating segment with total assets and you have to see if it increases if it is greater than or equal to 10% then it becomes an operating it becomes a reportable segment <clears throat> i repeat then it becomes a reportable segment now what next is there let's move a bit forward the next situation is yeah for each year you will have to do an assessment on each and every operating segment to see that if it meets the criteria for the reportable segment or not so for each year you would have to do it this way <clears throat> now let's move a bit forward the next situation that the examiner says is that it's profit or loss in absolute terms now a very important concept which is the concept in absolute terms what exactly do you mean by the absolute terms try to understand this if i talk about the absolute terms the absolute terms that you have to ignore the sign you have to ignore the sign positive or negative you just have to ignore and you just have to talk about the number so like for example if i say if i say the value of positive 100 if i say a value of negative 250 and if i ask you which one of them is a higher value so obviously you would say that 100 is the higher value but if i ask you people what is the higher value in absolute terms so in absolute terms 250 is a higher value so let's try to understand what the accounting standard means when it says absolute terms the absolute terms means the accounting standard is telling you look ignore the signs what is the accounting standard telling you it's saying look ignore the signs so it says its profit or loss in absolute terms is greater than or equal to 10% of the higher 10% of the higher in absolute terms of the profit of all operating segments having profit and the loss of all uh of all operating segments having a loss now see what happens is um assume that you've got a b c d e f you have got these six segments one of them has got 200 million profit this has got 80 million profit this has got 30 million profit this has got a loss of 100 million this has a loss of 300 million and this has a loss of 40 million so what happens is the accounting standard says you have to add up profit of all profit making segments you have to add up the loss of all loss making segments so if i say it's 200 plus 80 plus 30 gives you 310 as the profit if i talk about the loss it's 100 plus 300 plus 40 gives you 440 as a loss of all operating segments that had a loss in the current year now what do you need to do is that you need to say that if i talk about in absolute terms the higher value in absolute terms is going to be 440 i repeat the higher value 
and absolute terms is going to be 440 now if the higher value in absolute terms is going to be 440 so that means what we need to do is that we need to see if any operating segments that has a profit or loss of 44 if any operating segments has a profit or loss of 44 that is going to be considered as what that is going to be considered as an operating se segment that would become reportable. So now see, let's try to understand this. What is going to happen now is that we would say that 44 is the threshold, 44 is the benchmark. So if 44 is the benchmark, A becomes reportable, B becomes reportable, C is not reportable on this criteria. D becomes reportable, E becomes reportable, F is not reportable. Do you get it? So whatever the operating segments you have got, the multiple operating segments, what you have to do is that you have to check them against each of these criteria. If any of the criteria is met, you would make that operating segment reportable. If none of the criteria is met, then that operating segment would not become reportable. So do you get this profit and loss condition also? Yeah, do you people get it? Okay, so, uh, 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 okay, clear, 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 repeat it again. Okay, I'm just gonna do it. Is it because 30 upon 310? No, 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 no. It's not about 30 upon 310. Now see, you need to try and understand this thing. See, what happens is the rule was that you have to identify the profit of all profit making segment. You have to calculate the loss of all loss making segment. So we summed up the profit of all profit making segment. We summed up the loss of all loss making segments. Once we sum them up, it says in absolute terms. In absolute terms means you have to ignore the sign. You have to ignore the sign. So when you have to ignore the sign, so that means 440 becomes the higher amount. So the 10% of 440 is 44. So if any segment has got a profit or if any segment has got a loss, which is equals to or which is greater than 44, it's gonna become a reportable segment. Um, thank you for your um, uh, for your uh, input, uh, uh, Ms. Keen. Thank you for this. Okay, so if any of the operating segments, if any of the operating segment meets any of these criteria, it becomes a reportable segment. Let's move a bit forward. Now, um, with respect to IFRS 8, there is a 75% rule that you people have to keep in mind. I repeat, with respect to IFRS 8, there is a 75% rule that you people have to keep in mind. What is that 75% rule? Uh, yes, Nigongo, it's going to be recorded. Don't worry. Now, what is this 75% rule? Let's try to have a discussion of this. The 75% rule says that if the external sales of all reportable segments is
So it says the external sales of all reportable segments should be greater than or equal to 75% of entities external sales. I repeat, what does it say? Um, okay, Bola Edov. Um, uh, thank you for your question. Just just go through what I've mentioned here. If any, any of the following conditions, if there is any of these conditions that is met, it is going to become a reportable segment. I repeat, if any of the condition is met, it is going to become a reportable segment. So it, it, it doesn't need to be all three. It has to be either of them. Okay, now let's move a bit forward. So now what is this 75% rule? When we talk about the 75% rule, it says the external sales of all reportable segments should be greater than or equal to 75% of entities external sale. What do we mean by this? For example, you've identified, you've identified Yes, they can give different reportable segments, Jihane. Assume that, assume that you've got segment A, you've got segment B, you've got segment C. They've got internal sales, they've got external sales. You have made them reportable. Assume that you have to ignore their internal sales right now and you have to identify what is their external sale. Let's say their external sale is 570 million. And what is the entity's total external sale? So you identify that the entity's total external sale is 1000 million. You identify that the entity's total external sale is 1000 million. So now see, if the external sale of the entity is 570 million, and if the uh, external sale of all reportable segments is 570 million, and that of the entity is 1000 million, so what is going to happen? 570 divided by 1000 gives you 57%. I repeat, 570 divided by 1000 gives you 57%. So now, if 570 divided by 1000 gives you 57%, what exactly do you mean by this? This would actually mean that, this would actually mean that this 75% rule is not met. So if the 75% rule is not met, what are you going to do as an entity? You will identify, you will identify more operating segments and you will make them reportable. You will identify more operating segments and you'll make them reportable even if they don't meet any of the thresholds, even if they don't meet any of the criteria you will still identify more operating segments and you'll make them reportable. Even if they don't meet any of the criteria. So now there's a question that is being asked. So how would we decide which operating segment how to decide which operating segment is going to be made reportable? So obviously, obviously what are we trying to establish? We are trying to make sure that this 75% criteria is met. So whichever operating segment has highest external sales, whichever operating segment has got highest external sale, you are going to make them reportable. You're going to make them reportable. Even if they don't meet any of the 10% criteria of sales, of assets, or of profit, 
you just have to make sure that you end up getting the total external sales of all operate of all reportable segments to be 75% of the entity's external sales Okay, now what next is there? The next situation is that uh, this is the 75% rule. So what I could do is that I could just recall whatever I've taught you up till now. Uh, what happened is we started off discussing about this IFRS 8 operating segment. And when we talked about IFRS 8, we discussed that the objective of IFRS 8 is to make sure that you, that you disclose whatever possible information with respect to the operating segment uh, you disclose that. So we discussed about the definition of operating segment that what is an operating segment. And then the next thing that we did was we discussed about the concept of reportable segment. And I told you people that reportable segment is an operating segment whose results are separately presented in the financial statement. And how do we identify a reportable segment? So we identify a reportable segment using either the quantitative thresholds what exactly do you mean by quantitative threshold? So if any of these conditions are met, an operating segment becomes a reportable segment. What are these conditions? This condition could be with respect to sales. The condition could be with respect to, the condition could be with respect to assets. The condition could be with respect to profit or loss. So if any of these condition is, if any of these conditions is met, then an operating segment becomes a reportable segment. The next thing that we talked about is that uh, we talked about the 75% rule and I told you people that um, although you have to make sure that the 10% rule, the 10% criteria is met, but in case at times what happens is that this 75% rule is also required to be met. That is the external sales of all reportable segments. I repeat, the external sales of all reportable segments should be greater than or equal to 75% of entities external sales should be equal to or greater than 75% of the entities external sales. So in case if it is not there, then you have to identify more operating segments. In case if that is not there, then what actually happens is that you have to identify more operating segment and you have to make them reportable. 75% rule is applied after 10% rule. Once you have applied 10% rule, then you apply 75% rule. Okay, now let's move a bit forward. So now once you've identified this uh, uh, operating segment and you've identified the reported, reportable segment, so the next thing that actually goes about is the concept of disclosure. Now, what exactly do we need to disclose? So we need to be able to understand that, that what is it that we need to disclose? So there are multiple disclosures. There is a list of disclosure that you have to ensure that you follow. So what I'll do is that I'll not be talking about the disclosures right now, but I'll do one thing, which is 
there is one more criteria which needs to be discussed with respect to IFRS uh, 8, and that is called the criteria of aggregation. I repeat, there is a criteria which is called the aggregation criteria. Now, let me tell you that what exactly do we mean by this aggregation criteria? Let's discuss about it. Basically, what happens is a lot of companies, what they try to do is that they try to, they try to add up the results of multiple operating segments and consider them to be one single operating segment. So the point is, can I, can I add up multiple operating segments and make them one? Like, can I add up operating segment A with operating segment B, operating segment C with operating segment D, operating segment E with operating segment F? Can I do this? So the answer to this is that, yes, you can do, you can do if, if these operating segments have got similar, if these operating segments have got similar characteristics. So if the operating segments have got similar characteristics, you can always aggregate them. You can always add them up. Now, what are these similar characteristics? That is something that we need to understand. Now, what are those similar characteristics? It says that they need to have similar economic characteristics and the segment should be similar in each of the following respects. The nature of the products and the services, the nature of the products and the services. Now, let me give you an example of Unilever. Unilever has got multiple brands. It offers Pond Cream. It offers Sun Silk Shampoo. It offers the Lux Soap. It offers the Fair and Lovely, which is now being renamed as Glow and Lovely. It offers the Walls as a frozen dessert. It offers Lipton. There are multiple types of things that the Unilever offers. So what Unilever has done is that Unilever has actually combined all of these products under one single segment and that is called beauty segment. Why? Because it says the nature of these products and services is the same. The nature of the production process, so more or less the production process is the same. The type or class of customer, so usually universe, Unilever sells to distributor. Unilever sells to distributor. It does not go for the wholesale sale on its own. It does not go for the retail sale. It goes for the, it goes for the distributors. The methods to distribute their products, so it's a third party distributors usually. And if applicable, the nature of regulatory environment, for example, banking, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So what Unilever does is that in its financial statement, it presents three. It presents three operating segments, uh, three reportable segments. One of them is a beauty section. The other one of them is called uh, the uh, ice cream section. And the third one of them is a beverages section under which it shows all of its Lipton uh, tea and the other tea brands that it operates. So what happens is, this is something which is termed as an aggregation. Otherwise, Pond itself would be considered as a separate operating segment. Sun Silk would be a separate operating segment. Lux would be a separate operating segment because they are such large businesses. So although they might be such large businesses, but to make things easy for themselves, and for the user of financial statement, they've aggregated these operating segments. So what could happen is in case if your operating segments have got similar economic characteristics, then what you as an entity could do is that you could aggregate these operating segments and make them considered to be one single operating segments for the purposes of the checking against the 10% rule or for the purposes of checking against the 75% rule. That is something that you could do as an entity. <clears throat> is that okay now? Okay now. So one of the important areas with respect to the accounting under the IFRS 8 <coughs> is to be able to identify the reportable segment that what exactly are the segments that are going to become reportable. So for you to be able to identify the reportable segment, the first and the foremost thing that you have to do as an entity is that you have to identify the operating segments first, and then you have to identify the what, uh, then you have to establish, then you have to detect which of these operating segment becomes a reportable segment. That is something 
that you would have to do as an entity. Okay, Jihani, how it will look like? Don't worry about it. It will test you against the criteria. It will test you against the criteria of the segments meeting the operating segment or not. So that is what it is going to do. It is going to test you against the criteria. Okay, so we are done with this specific part of the IFRS 8. Um, so I'm going to end my class till here. Uh, in our next class, we will be talking about the disclosure requirements of IFRS 8 and how an exam question on IFRS 8 is going to be, is going to be uh, tested and how do we need to answer that question. So we are gonna discuss that in our next class.